I'm going to start with the, um, the macro outlook here and more particularly it's really annoying to me that I have to discuss this again but apparently I do and that would of course be the Fed. So <clears throat> I've written a couple of articles about the Fed and my views on monetary policy and how they see things and they've all proven to be pretty spot on. The, um, so what happened today? You had um, Janet Yellen in a testimony in front of Congress and it was sort of started out as a bit of a Fed witch hunt. Uh, some grandstanding for some talking points that um, they, they like to do. <clears throat> and it, there was a question about uh, interest rates and, and the Fed hike. And Janet Yellen basically um, said she thinks the economy is strong but, and growing at a moderate pace. This is basically what she's been saying the whole time. Um, that there, uh, there was also some comments by Dudley and I think by Yellen that she was saying that the, um, the wage inflation is fairly weak and that there's still some slack in the labor force. Now, this is really, um, I guess been overhyped by the media for a while. I think the same people who have been trying to say that every, dis every word that comes out of the Fed's mouth is hawkish. I think that um, the networks have to sell ad space and I think they already have declining viewer rates because they don't really put on relevant or actionable trading ideas and that the um, audience is a lot more sophisticated than it may have once been. But I guess if they create some fear, that would get people to start tuning in more. Now, the Fed recently had minutes that came out as well, and those were viewed as being hawkish as well, and then the market rallied anyway. So the Fed, by their own admission, they have not reached their 2% inflation rate, their own set target of their inflation rate and they downgraded the labor force outlook. So they don't see um, jobs being as strong and their other major metric with the inflation rate, they don't see until uh, reaching until 2018. There was some, some banter that uh, they had kind of upgraded the global economy, saying that they're not focusing on the macro as much. I think it was because they really just came under a lot of a lot of scrutiny that they had basically been kind of looking to the f foreign car car uh, sorry foreign markets for direction and i think the fed wanted to walk that back and they sort of put the ball back in the domestic court but the problem is is that the domestic numbers aren't that good the um i guess that the, today there was a jump in the um, atlanta fed the expected gdp from 1.9 to 2.3 percent that's a pretty big jump at least in Fed parlance as well, but it's still really not that great. And yeah, I understand that there was a jump in the um, expected Fed, uh, the percentage that the Fed was going to not go. I think it hit 58% and settled in around 52 to 54. So now it's a consensus view that the Fed is going to go in December. I don't really think so. Um, I, w I still would view that as a huge policy era. The um, GDP has is really just around two percent that's very very vulnerable in terms of um to shock risk and i just i just don't see it happening by the fed's own measures i've said this before that they would more likely do more qe than raise interest rates i don't expect that this year i don't even expect that in the first quarter next year the soonest I think we would have that happen is the summer. But um, if I were the Fed, I mean, I'm not, I'm obviously I'm not, but um, if I were them, I would really want to see what the Q4 um, GDP is like for this year, see how good the holiday season is, really get a true read on the consumer, and then see what the first quarter is like. The last couple of years have had disastrous first quarters. And someone had mentioned to me on the stream today that they thought the Fed was going to hike just so they don't look foolish not raising this year, the Fed looks brilliant right now having not raised because if they would have raised, all of the economic numbers are, are looking terrible here. The, it makes no sense to me that they would look be, to be raising. The reason the Fed would want to hike is if they see some type of inflation or an overheating economy, and the economy here is really just muddling along. I assure you those employment numbers 
the headline that 5.1% or so is really very misleading. I have, I'll tell you, I, have, I know a lot of people. I've lived in New York for a very long time. I ran a, um, a nightlife marketing company before this. I mean, I know hundreds, even maybe thousands of people, and I talk to them. You know, I, I'm now I'm, I trade full time, and this is my, my gig, but I still have a lot of people I know, and I touch base with them, you know, on, somewhat on occasion. And I assure you, the jobs market is not good at all. It's actually rather crappy. A lot of my friends who've lived in New York have moved because they think it's gotten too expensive. Some of them, after their, around 2011, a lot of them moved. And I'm starting to actually see a bit of an uptick again of that, of people moving or they're, you know, they're cycling through jobs rather quickly. So uh, the economy is not great here. Real estate, I've noticed, is the prices have been slowing a little bit. The um, rents have gotten out of control. P we've gone from a nation of homeowners to a nation of renters. And I think the uh, percentage of household income now that's being consumed between rent, food, I guess travel, and somewhat of entertainment is like almost all of it. And that leaves savings very low. Yes, it would help those savers if um, the Fed raised rates, they'd get more money on their deposits, but the Fed doesn't want money sitting in bank accounts. It wants it out in the economy trying to stimulate growth. And we are not a nation of savers anyway. We're a nation of consumers. We have to have the new iPhone. We have to have the new, apparently not GoPros. Um, we have to have the new Tesla. We have to have the new whatever. So I believe that the Fed is still on hold, uh, sorry to get a little bit wonky on you, but I do a lot of like proprietary research. This doesn't just come out of, you know, thin air. I do a lot of on, I guess, grassroots research on my own, not just what we were told. And those d indicators do not look healthy to me. They still look really rather weak. So I think I, I think I covered the Fed here pretty well. I do, if they go in December, I will say this, it's a policy mistake, and I think that the market will pay a very, very heavy price for it. I don't know if it'll be on the snap, but at that point, I would have to really, I'd have to really reassess my view on, on not only the economy, but on the market. And I feel that the, um, there, would be, there would be real policy mistake error there, and that the Fed um, would be... Uh, they, would, they would look terrible if they had to reverse that and then start uh, lowering rates again or even doing QE because of the damage that they would cause from raising interest rates. Now, why would raising interest rates cause so much damage? I've heard, I've had the arguments, uh, a, a, a huge argument here on the stream with people, that, oh, you know, one quarter of a point won't make a difference. Again, I, I, I can't believe I have to even say this again. It's just like, it's so infuriating. It's not the amount of the rate hike that matters. It's the policy change from accommodation to, from easing and accommodation to tightening. That change is huge. And it would, you know, it sort of eliminates the Bernanke put, the Yellen put. It, it would be, it would be a huge shift in psychology. It would be a huge shift in the markets. It would also wreak havoc on our economy. In, in the immediate sense that we already have a strong dollar problem and already have a trade deficit problem. And a, a rate hike would immediately strengthen the dollar. You have the Europeans devaluing, you have the Asians, the um, Japanese and Chinese devaluing like, like it was nothing. And uh, the Fed would be tightening with an already strong dollar. It would be such a self-inflicted blow. We already have huge amounts of debt to service that debt would then become incrementally more expensive. We would widen our trade deficits tremendously, and the strong dollar would hurt foreign companies' earnings. This would be a disaster for the U.S. economy, and the Fed would be front and center to blame for that. You know, in the 1920s, the Fed, again, also thought the market had been out of control in terms of the gains, and it was sort of their irrational exuberance days back then. This is not the 1920s, I assure you. The economy is nowhere nearly as overheated as it was back in 1929. I've done an amazing amount of research that I will not discuss here, but the, there are some similarities, I will say this. There, there are some, there, I will admit that there are some, some similarities. If anyone's interested in that, we can discuss it another time. I really want to try and get through this section as quickly as possible, though, so let's, um, 
let's do that. Um, but uh, we are not as overheated as then, but I don't think the uh, it, it, then as now, the Fed engaged in a type of moral suasion of talking down the markets to try to avoid the, 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 ine the inevitability of a blow-off conclusion. And we could be setting up for that, believe it or not, um, setting up for a blow-off top. And I, I was even saying this even when the market was down a lot. So <clears throat> we'll have to see what happens. It's not a foregone conclusion that that will happen. But it is a likely possibility. Anyhow, let's. Um, I think we covered the macro enough. Um, do you guys want more Fed, or do you want me to start ho hopping into some individual names? Uh, you know, I always use mob rule here. So, what what do you guys prefer? More Fed, more uh, macro, or do we want to hop into some individual names? Just you know, type type it out. Want more Fed? More Fed. Names, Facebook. So it's it's sort of a bit of a balance here. Um, I'll do I'll do a smidge more on this. If if we do get the rate hike, um, like I said, if 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 the market happens to give you a gift and rally on that, please take it. If the market does sell off on that, you kind of you kind of want to get out quickly. Um, I don't really believe that they are going to raise this year. We'll have to see, though. I really, um, I really, I, I, we have some numbers this week. I think, I think the Fed also really just wants to keep themselves relevant. That's really it. I mean, like they were so neutered and so sidelined that I think that they wanted to inject their self into it. It was really good that they kind of had shut up, right? But now they're they're back in the thick of it. So we'll have to see how that goes. Anyhow, let's. Um, I'll discuss a little bit more of that in the weekend review video. Um, I'll pick up a little bit more where I left off with that. Anyhow, let's jump into some individual stocks and um, get going with that. So we had a lot going on with regard to some big levels here. <clears throat> and the S&P, and I'm, I always like to talk about SPY because it's one that a lot of people have in their, um, in their portfolios. I don't know too many retail traders who whip around the SPX contracts. Uh, some ES, but... Uh, we could just talk about SPY. Anyhow, uh, the key level here, there are some key levels. You might want to just jot this down that I think are important. And I always like to look for the Fed day range. I can't stress this, this to you enough. The day of the Fed or the day of the ECB, the day of a big emotion event bar, like an earnings day, for example, for stocks, that would be the equivalent. Um, the Fed is sort of like the, the big earnings event for the, uh, the market. Anything above that high of day is bullish. Anything in the middle is just chop and you sort of don't want to be involved. And anything below there, you want to be short. We are now above that level. Um, whether or not you like the market or not, we are still above that level. The level is 208.98. That was the high of day that day. You had a pullback low of 207.74. So until those levels are breached, I think you can still kind of play a little bit of buy the dip. If we... Um, if we come back into that range, you know, you kind of maybe want to just flatten up and be looking to uh, either see if it's a look, you know, kind of a look below and fail or a look below and accept into that range. I think the reason that we've rallied so much, and I think it's really caught a lot of people off guard, is this, is we were, we were sideways for the better part of a year. I had not been bullish on the market at all. And a lot of people, I think I expressed that um, I don't know if I had, but I, I think I had expressed that I was bearish or you know very cautious. I kept on saying cautious, cautious, and we wound up getting a really, really big break, and it it basically um, got down to the 18, low 1800s, and we rallied, we pulled back, and I said that I was starting to get bullish again in the 187s, which turned out to be the pullback low. And that worked out really well, and I've really never looked back. I am starting to get more cautious again up here, though, and I'm going to talk about why. So we, we rallied. We hit a lot of Fibonacci levels. We pulled into some ranges. We got to a downtrend. And then the downtrend, there was a gap, hold, and then go. And the pullbacks have been, on, the pullbacks have been like on days with like positive breath, which is crazy, or like really mildly... Like the down days are like one or two or three to one negative, and like the up days can be like even like five or five to one or eight to one positive. So the pullbacks are being bought. 
And I think this is because we've all turned on the TV and we've seen the Ackmans and the Einhorns and so on and so forth have really, um, have really underperformed. And I think that there's a lot of catch up being made by a lot of people, performance chasing by people who have been underwater or need, or need performance. They are forced to buy, so to speak. Where do I get the information on the breath? I have a, um, I have a very, very highly customized platform, and um, it's actually more customized than I think. It, maybe it's even too customized. But um, I have a, 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 a think script that gives me the breath reading. You can get the absolute number by taking dollar sign uval minus dollar sign dval. And that gives you a graphical representation of the breath. But as far as the ratios go, I have a, um, a think script for that. So anyhow, the market is way overbought here, though. I will say short term, we are really overbought. We've rallied really big. We got even a little bit higher than I think we probably should have. But we're kind of at the, the end of a distribution here. Um, the, at least the end of the meat of it. And I think that there were the problem, and I'm really surprised actually that there wasn't more responsive sellers up here. Maybe it was just what we weren't down that long. Like the correction just lasted a little while and there really wasn't as much panic as you might have thought. Although down 1,400 points or 1,000 points in a day, that to me is pretty, uh, me is pretty scary. But we have rallied back. Maybe we want to see a Fibonacci extension we're seeing one in after hours on Facebook, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, I was th thinking that we would probably see some more resistance somewhere between 207 and really into the thick, the 207s and into the thick of it of 210. And we've we got there, and now we now we're starting to see a little bit of the response of selling. We're into sort of the thick, the middle of the range of the upper, really the upper distribution. So, I will say this now. We have a two-day equal low, roughly, about yesterday was 209.70, and today was 209.72. So you'll often hear me talk about this. I do this a lot on the stream. where I, I did this with cores, where I talked about two-day lows and saying that you should be long versus those. And wow, look at that thing. That thing was up huge today. That was a, a really good uh, call. Um, I hope many of you caught it. I know a couple of people did. Anyhow, uh, if we're below the two-day low now tomorrow, and it's possible we are, then I would say that we probably are going to correct a little bit, maybe into the 207s. I believe that the market can, believe it or not, pull back even down to the 204s. I know it's a, a pretty chunky pullback, but we could still correct down to there and still be healthy. There's a gap to kind of fill down there, and I think that that actually would be the most healthy thing. I don't know if the market's going to want to do that. It might want to just keep going. In terms of individual stocks, um, wait, wait, wait. With regard to SPY, let me just let me just conclude with that. The expected move and for the next two days is two dollars and thirty-one cents, and next week's expiration is three dollars and ninety-four cents. If we come down, I expect next week's number to beef up. So um, the the. No, no. The, yeah, the only way to follow, there's three, uh, someone, I just want to interrupt for one second. There are a few ways to follow my calls. One is I do these Periscope videos. Two, I do the weekend review. If you're not subscribed, subscribe on my YouTube channel. That's Justin Pulitzer Trades. Or yes, on Twitter um, is at Justin Pulitzer. That's my handle. That's really the, the kind of the speedboat, the fastest way to do it. But the weekend videos, I think I do give a lot of stuff on there. Actually, I um, did Tesla on there, and that wasn't on the stream. So I, I try to do, I'm trying to do that more often. I'm really trying to force people to subscribe for the videos. So I'm not giving all the trades on the stream. I'm trying to get reward people for their, um, I guess, their viewership. Um, I'll talk about Tesla in a minute. Anyhow, watch the two-day low here. If we break that tomorrow, I think there will be some more room to the downside. If we break the, I guess, the high of the day, we probably, I think at some point we're going to retest these old, old all-time highs. We are so close here. It's like spitting distance. You have to be thinking that we're going to try, probably try. Um, we may fail here at a lower high. We'll see. But my thinking is maybe we're going to retest. Um, I think we are at the kind of the upper part of a channel here. So it doesn't surprise me that we pull back some stocks here that are running into a little bit of resistance. 
Exxon hit some resistance here. I had talked about 86s being key. It ran into 87s. Now we're roughly around 86s. 83s had been the prior big level there, so it's okay if it pulls back to 83. You can try that for Roro. If it loses 83, then I think the market's going into correction mode. I've used Exxon as a proxy for a while. It's worked really, really well. Um, but it's now at a level where, it need the, where we need to see real growth. And I've talked about 86 being that level. So if we're not going to see some real growth, we are going to have a correction. That is how it is. Um, <clears throat> Apple, on the other hand, is, um, is sort of uh, a little bit of a bell of the ball here. Um, it's interesting. We have a very bifurcated market. You have these momentum stocks doing really, really well. The Apples, the Amazons, the Googles, the Facebooks, the um, price lines. These stocks are all hitting all new time highs. And then you have another market where you like in the, a lot of the commodities where they are getting absolutely destroyed. So I think that, and that goes to the inflation and the global growth. It shows that there is a change in the economy. The world is different than it was a few years ago. You know, we're not in the Walmart worlds. We're in the Amazon worlds. So this is, not, again, also, by the way, feeds perfectly into my thesis about employment. As you get more automated, as you get more technologically advanced, as you get more real-time supply chain management, as you get more inventory management, you need less human beings. You don't need you know, a huge assembly line full of people whose medical insurance, Obamacare you have to pay, whose unemployment insurance you have to pay. You pay a robot. You buy the robot and you don't pay anything after that, maybe some maintenance fees. And this is what is happening. Big box retailers, you know, I, I know that um, Walmart did this big, I guess, pay increase recently, but I think what the next move is going to be is there's going to be some layoffs. So, and maybe some, maybe you'll start seeing some store closing as, as we move from like a big box retail. Like who the hell wants to, like, do you ever watch the, they always show it on TV. Who the hell wants to wait online there for that Black uh, Friday or whatever, and then get trampled over by people and fighting in the aisles over, you know, you know, uh, for a $50, you know, a $50 off of a TV or whatever. I mean, who the hell wants to do that? You just want to go online be able to look at all of the brands. Like if I want a product now, I don't go to a store anymore. I go on my Am I pick up my iPhone, I hit on the Amazon uh, app, and then I search, and I get, you know I can see I can I see the app, and I can buy it immediately, really cheap. Or I go to Google and I do a quick search. The world is oh, it's different. It's very changed. So that is why you have these you know the I sort of the technology stocks. The new world economy is rallying, and the old world economy is not following. I think that that um, I'm a six guy. I tried the plus; it was too big. It felt like it was falling out of my back pocket. Um, anyway, so that, I guess that's the new challenge, right? Or do you have a six instead of the old days? Remember, it was a Coke and Pepsi challenge. Now it's if you have the iPhone six or the six plus, or or an Android or whatever. Um, Anyway, so that's so that covers Apple. As long as Apple is above 120, 119 to 120, that is the area it needs to hold for still higher. As long as that area holds, it's the stock. It's along. If it breaks that area, then you know you want to be GTFO because we're probably going to see the 115s and maybe the 109s again, and then we you know we start with that game. Um, I think the 50-day moving average there would be a good write or write out type of an, a place, by the way. Um, so that's Apple, uh, Amazon. You know, I'm looking at this chart, and I've been bullish on Amazon. I have been bullish for a long time on Amazon, actually. It's getting a little out of control here. Um, you know, you had any, I had said anything above 619.45 was bullish. Now you're at 645. The 1.618 Fibonacci extension is one, I'm sorry, 660.64. I'm, I cannot believe we're there already. That is your level. If we, I would say between here and there, it's probably a good idea to book some profits on rallies. Um, it, it's starting to get very steep. There will be, you know, this stock has gone through some very, very painful corrections in the past. At some point, there will be one too. Uh, you know, I, this just reminds me, I posted on the um, stream today, and I think a lot, I, I, I'll tell you, I've, 
I've traded for a long time. I've been trading since I was a teenager, believe it or not, since I was old enough to open up a trading account. And then even before then, my grandfather used to buy me stocks, and we used to look at the uh, the New York, I'm sorry, the Wall Street Journal together. And look, back when you had to actually hold paper and look up ticker symbols, yeah, I used to do that. Um, so I've been following the market for a while, and I can tell you that this, and this is going to sound very hard to um, to comprehend because we're in the Twitter world, and everyone, of course, is the genius who sells the exact peak to the tick and the genius who bought the exact tick to the bottom. I assure you that is not how the real world works, and it is often more important to know when to buy or sell at the right time than catching the exact peak or the exact trough. You know, it's okay to be off by a little bit. It's not okay to be off by a lot, of course, but you want to be, it's okay to be off by a smidgen, and you know you're not going to be the guy who catches you know the you know the exact tick to the top. I mean it's happened. I've had it happen to me before. I've been that guy a few times actually, but um, not always. And just keep that in mind if you're getting super duper greedy and first chasing stocks that have run huge and then run again and again. Just be careful. I think that's also um, what's been plaguing um, Facebook a little bit after hours here. Um, it's it's still up pretty much. I mean, it's still up pretty well. It got up to one of the um, Fibonacci extensions that I had talked about. Um, it was really a shame with Facebook. I wanted to to talk about a more specific earnings play um, with with options, but there really was. It was really with either just long or short, and it got one of my big levels here, and it backed off pretty hard from there. There, I had talked about two um, 1.618 Fibonacci extensions, and if you X out the flash crash, that was 109.26. If I'm sorry, 109.28. If you include the flash crash, it's 116.07. Um, so we got 109.34. So it basically ticked it to the to the. It basically got there a little bit over. So I think the problem now with Facebook is going to be that a lot of people played it long. They, um, they, you know, you have people who um, will probably be looking to book some profits. So there might be a little bit of selling. I would be a little bit cautious if you're first foraying into Facebook. I've been, I have been bullish on Facebook since $20. Um, yeah, it got down to 19, and it, um, you know, I was wrong, often wrong, but I was wrong by a buck. I didn't buy the exact low, but I've been bullish since, um, since 20 bucks, and. I had been saying I thought for a very long time it would get to 100. We are well over 100 now. Um, it's probably a good idea to book a little bit of profits into the euphoria. Longer term, I've said this, I think Facebook could even double again, believe it or not. As crazy as that sounds, it's very possible. I think they're doing some really great initiatives. Their Instagram initiative is huge. Instagram is actually the reason why I think Twitter has been getting creamed. It's um, that Snapchat, although I'm not a, I'm not a Snapchatter. Um, I am an Instagrammer, though. I, um, I think that that's been really good for them. They're monetizing that now. They're going to have the buy button. They have that um, send money to friends feature that's pretty big overseas. And I think that, you know, they had a great quarter. You know, they're doing well. There's no reason to, um, you know, get off the sort of the train that works. But I do believe that the stock has had pullbacks before. And I would prefer to f prefer to play by the dip than um, than chase. The real breakout here was ninety nine dollars and I think twenty four cents. That would be a, if there's some type of correction. That would be the first you know the first area to buy the dip. If that didn't hold, you know you'd um, you'd have to go lower. I'm sure there's going to be tons of upgrades tomorrow. The stock is going to be really euphoric. There'll be a big market to maybe book some profits into. Um, all right, so that's Facebook. Um, long term, so long term bullish, short term maybe a little bit cautious. The options premiums were nothing today. They will be zeroed practically tomorrow. Buy some protection is my advice. It's going to be real, real cheap tomorrow. So let's see, Netflix. So Netflix, I've had sort of a um, an on again, off again romance with, and I had. I had been playing it long. I played it short. I've done pretty well with it, actually. Um, I haven't been involved with it as much recently. Um, I was actually playing it short, and I sort of felt the the tide turning um, before this big rally. 
And I had messaged that the stock wasn't acting right for a short. So I should have really reversed and gone majorly long, but you know, you can't be in every move all the time. And I was a little bit cautious on the name. It got to the 110 that I had been looking for, and it's now today broken the downtrend, and it should not have rallied this high if it was going to be bearish. So I do believe that Netflix probably is overextended now to the buy side, but as long as you can hold over that 110 area, I think you can kind of play by the dip. I'm willing to say that it can slip to the, you know, really the true, the true neckline here was the 103.88 to 105. I don't know if I'd be willing to sit in that for, I guess it's not that big of a, a, big of a point d- difference, but, you know, I'd be a little bit careful. If you lost today's breakout bar, let's use today's range. So 109.39, if you lose that, I'd be a little bit cautious. <clears throat> it's also, was there, there was a few days consolidation. There were like three days consolidation below there. So if you start losing there and like the 107s now, then I would get more cautious. Then I would be a little bit sort of the uh, maybe, you know, get out of there. Um, it could be a false breakout mode. But right now the stock is looking pretty bullish. I think if it could take out this sort of reference high here of like close to 116, then you'll probably see the old all-time high and maybe even a Fibonacci extension of that. Today you had, um, I think it was CBS. This is again goes back to the old economy versus the new economy. People are cutting cords. They're not watching cable. They're tired. I'm almost doing it myself. I'm tired of paying these huge cable bills for these crappy shows when I can just see them on net and going to the movies and spending a fortune when I could just go to Netflix and see it for like for nothing. So that's, that's, I, I think Netflix is doing really, really well. Apple, by the way, made a ginormous mistake not buying them when they had the chance when it was like 40 bucks. Wow, was that a huge snafu. But I, I think longer term, the stock is probably bullish. But, you know, it does go through periods of time where people don't like it. So buy it on dips, you know, rather than chasing. Um, so that covers Netflix. Uh, speaking of, of this, there was, there is the matter of the mouse house of Disney. So I was looking to play this short for earnings. Um, I don't know if I discussed it on the stream, but I've definitely discussed it privately with a lot of you who have messaged me. Um, maybe even in the video, I have to check. I might've even discussed this in the video. Um, I'm a little upset today that it went down on the CBS number. That really pissed me off because I like when a stock goes down big and then takes a really, really long time and inchworms its way all the way back up to the gap fill, and then you can slam it again for their earnings. Um, I've seen this happen before on a lot of stocks. It's just a great technical setup. Unfortunately, this crap today, I'm sorry, I'm I'm in a bit of a fired up mood, I guess, um, you know, all these reporters with who are trying to make the Fed sound uh, hawkish have me in a bit of a vendetta type of mood. But um, this screwed up the earnings play today. Um, the stock was down a lot. I think it flushed out a lot of the weak chasers. It still closed above the down. I, I guess it really wasn't there. I can't really draw a downtrend, but um, let me get rid of that, actually. that You can't really draw the downtrend. Um, it kind of held, I guess, the uptrend. I want to, let me just draw that in here. We're not even close. So we basically held the 20 day moving average. I'm starting to think, and I'll, this is as crazy as this is going to sound, and this is just how my brain works. If we're down big again tomorrow ahead of the earnings, I might play it long. I mean, uh, you know, it'll have flushed out a lot of people. I, I will have to see how this plays. You know, if, if they can. Um, you know, today the problem is is that you took out a lot of people. So I really was just hoping for more and more and then to do it. But this sort of may have messed up the earnings play. Um, like I said, if it's down again big tomorrow, like another big body day like today, I'll probably be playing along for a bounce. This messed it up, though, and I have to kind of, you know, sometimes that just happens. Life happens, and it just kind of sort of messed up the um, play for that. So let's uh, – that covered Disney. Um so, yeah, if it's strong again, I mean, you know, it, it may not, um, it might not set up for the short like it did, would have, but um, I would be now if it's down big. That's really what I'm looking for. Um, 
So that's Disney. Someone mentioned, what's this? Uh, someone asked me about, um, let's see. Let me talk about BABA for a minute. So BABA is rallying a lot. It's um, it's above that earnings day high. It got the, uh, and I had, I had mentioned this, that I had said that the earnings gap day was the key, 82.79. It's above there. I think that this is probably getting, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't think it's getting extended. It is definitely getting extended. You're into sort of the meat of where the sort of sell-off was. I guess there's some room to maybe 89. That's, yeah, it's still a pretty good uh, amount of uh, rally left. But last year, the stock topped out on singles day, which is 11.11. And that may be the case again. Um, I had said in a prior video I thought we could rally into Singles Day, and that's what's happening. Um, so long into Singles Day, and probably get out maybe the day before Singles Day. That's uh, that's my thinking. So that's Baba. Um, what was the other one I wanted to cover? Um, Baidu. Uh, yeah. So I had been bullish on Baidu. Um, I had talked about that in a prior video. I thought it was going to get to the downtrend line, and at there, I said I was sort of. Um, after that, I was sort of agnostic. It probably was a good time to take profits. Uh, we are through that downtrend line now, though. Um, I will say this: there is a gap coming up where this sort of the down move really began, and that was around 206.25. That is also the absolute peak of the volume distribution up there. So the best thing that this could do is just gun it to there and then maybe try right or right out short for an intraday, maybe even start it as a day trade. If it works, you know, great, use it as a swing trade. If it um, just guns through there, it would be right or right out. So, you know, you wouldn't really be taking very much of a loss there. But um, yeah, I'm starting to get a little bit cautious on these stocks because they're starting to be up ginormous. And let's talk about, so I covered Amazon. Oh, so, all right, this is a big, big discussion um, with the bank stocks. All right, so everyone is all excited and, and ex, you know, oh, the Fed is going to raise rates now, right? That, so it's time to buy the bank, bank stocks. Completely wrong. Um, those stocks are so heavily regulated and so neutered, they're not even the bank stocks anymore. They're like eunuchs carrying around their you-know-what's in a jar. I am not, sorry to be too blunt and to, you know, but I really wanted to drive home that, um, that graphical image of them being, you know, kind of done. They've been so heavily smacked by regulation that their profit outlook is not nearly what it was before the financial crisis. If you're really geeked up and you want to believe the, the myth of the rate hike or you want to play that, the insurance companies are the new financials. They make glob, gobs of money and they're able to put it into um, treasuries and into all kinds of interest rate sensitive um, instruments and they will be the big beneficiaries if, um, if there is rate hikes. I don't, I'm not, I mean, yeah, I'm sure you'll get some rally in the banks or whatever. You know, a lot of people have been excited about Bank of America. They've been excited at Bank of America for a long time. I will say this, though, um, in defense of Bank of America, the stock is in this very long consolidation pattern for a while. And if it can break that range above, like, the 18s, it's going to go a lot higher. So... I would set that alert and, you know, I would, I'd be looking if, it, if you can break that area, you know, like I said, a lot higher. Right now it's just in the middle of the range, sort of getting toward the upper part of the range. It's rallied a lot here. So on this, I guess it filled the gap. So it's kind of put up or shut up time for this. I, if it gets to that higher end of the range in a straight line like it is now, then I would be looking to lean into it short, um, at least for a pullback, maybe even to mid-range. I love when things rally in straight lines from lower ends of ranges to higher ends of ranges without any break. This is starting to have a little bit of a break here, but it's not enough that if we didn't get there that I wouldn't try the trade. It would be right or right out, and then if it breaks through, then I would probably flip a roo and be long. 
So that's my view. I, I prefer the insurance companies over the banks, though. I think that their profit profiles are better. So um, someone had asked me about this Solar City. Um, I played it a little bit long. The um, 28, what was this? There was a reference. I played it long after the print. I was not long for that beatdown, by the way. I would be very upset if I was. It would also be very uncharacteristic of me to be long something like that ahead of a print like that. Um, although it was, it was down a lot into the print. So that's why I think it's finding a little bit of traction here. There was a lot of capitulation level volume. You had a tweezer bottom the first two days, and now you have like a tweezer top now the next two days. I played this with some short puts. I am like maybe up a couple of beans on it. It's basically break even. If this is weak again tomorrow, I'm just going to take it off because it's just, it's just chop. And I, I don't, I, you know, yeah, there's a lot of IV and premium to be collected, but I really, if it loses these levels, there's really not much reference here, and it would be playing a guessing game, and that's really not what I do. So that's City, um, Solar City. If you, by the way, if you take out those highs again. Um, I would be looking to to probably add to the position. So that would be over 3190 those 2-day highs. So you'd be at 4 day it'd be like a 4 or 5 day high, then I'd be looking to maybe add and play more for the gap fill. So it's either I'm going to be out or I'm either going to be right out or I'm going to be adding. As crazy as that sounds. Um, I might even believe it or not if it breaks those lows, maybe even flip short. Because then you'd not only have you'd have four or five days of overhead supply, plus you're breaking a tweezer low. So I'll be doing something in Solar City. I'll probably be tweeting about it. Uh, FireEye. So I mentioned someone asked me about FireEye. So here's the scoop. I had been very bullish on this stock. I, first of all, I hated this stock for a very long time because near the highs when they did that. Um, Un, when they also did, they pulled like a GoPro. They unlocked shares prematurely. That really pisses me off when management does things like that. There was a lot of insider selling. The stock had rallied back. It had started to turn actually before the big run in it. And then it's now coming back down. I was um, very cautious on this name. And I had said that today actually on the stream that the um, 26 puts were high OI meaning high open interest, so probably somewhere near the low, this 2481 to 25 area, is probably a good area for right or right out to buy the, to buy the dip. So I think that there could be maybe a, um, a, there's a good play here, and I guess you have a, a good reference low here of these like 24s. If you start losing the 24s, um, you know, I don't think it's a big deal to risk a dollar on a, on a stock like this, but um, that's, that's about it. I would be, um, I think it's a right or right out trade. If they, um, if they break that, you know, after hours low, then just GTFO. Simple as that. That's FireEye. Um, the real tell for me with FireEye was Palo Alto Networks, um, which I have been... I had been bullish on, and then I'm, I've been bearish on. As crazy as that sounds, I'd been bullish for a while, and then I flipped when it broke the 50-day, because the 50-day had been the, really the key. Um, that was also going to be, I was really waiting for um, a retouch of the 50 to, you know, to, to really pound this thing even more short, but uh, we didn't get there. We're down now big. This is a head and shoulders, um, a really sloppy-looking head and shoulders. The last few days' rally was just a check back to the neckline, and now we're going to get a break. So this could have uh, some some real downside, even maybe into the low, maybe like 120 into the 120s. As crazy as that sounds, uh, that would be the channel low. I've drawn in a drawn in a. There's a couple ways to draw the channel. That would be a really extreme channel. That's including the flash crash. But um, I, I do think that these stocks probably. I don't know if the cybersecurity story is over, but the stock story is kind of winding down a little bit. Um, I believe, like I said, though, um, I do like that FireEye opportunistically. I don't know. I think Palo Alto probably is going to be a little bit iffy ahead of their print. If it's down huge into the print, then maybe it's a buy, but we'll see. We'll cross that bridge. We have a ways to go until that comes. Um, Tesla. 
Okay, so I had talked about this being a shake and bake setup, that if it was weak into the print, it was a long, and it was. Um, we are now into some, and it was, right? And it's now into some resistance. We got the 200 day. Someone had asked me after hours yesterday. It's all on the stream if you want to look. I believe, I think it's on, I think that's on the stream. Um, that I said I thought the 200 day moving average was going to be the, the move. We got there. We could see the 50. Um, that's 236s, but there was a pretty steep breakdown. A rever there was a big reversal bar and then a breakdown from 234s. So I'm getting a little bit cautious. I do think there is a lot of people still short this. I do think it could maybe get to the 246s to have the full gap fill. But, um, you know, let's maybe give it a day or two and see if it really holds this gain. Um, Longer term, I do think Tesla is, um, I actually think the stock is going to see new all-time highs at some point. The story about Tesla isn't really so much the story of the company or the stock. It's about the mechanics of the stock market. It's got a high, owner in, high consolidated insider ownership. It's a poorly distributed stock, meaning it's not owned by a lot of institutions. It's also heavily shorted. That is the key there. And when you add in those types of um, store, and it's of course a momentum stock with a good, with a pretty good story. So as when you add that up, I, I've always thought that the better play with Tesla has been longer, long than short, because the owner Elon Musk can do a lot to damage you if you're, you know, caught short. He's been known to tweet, and those have been known to cause some big, big squeezes. I think you're in a squeeze now. I. Um, like I said, I want to just see um, I want to just see it hold these gains, but I do think that uh, you probably can sell some puts now into the stock on dips, probably 205 strike or lower, and those would work. If you want to play some call spreads, um, I think that that's okay too, um, actually. So let's see how that goes. Uh, is there anything I didn't cover? Someone had asked me about this blue. I've never even looked at this stock before, so. Let's see, I'll do this one cold. Um, that's a horrendous chart. Uh, all right, so did they report? I think they, let me see, when are they reporting? Um, estimate they blo they, blo they missed earnings. Let's see, how is the stock reacting after hours? I'm just on a daily chart. I'm doing this one cold, I've never even heard of this stock. Um, I'm not seeing that much movement after hours. All right, so anyway, let's anyway, we know they blew earnings. If they can't go down on bad earnings, the stock will probably rally a little bit. Um, I would say that this is still a down pattern. The stock is this is about as ugly as it gets. My god, 197. I bet all the analysts were upgrading it up there too. Um, this is one of these bio stocks. Uh, I think it can see some more bounce maybe, but uh, I, I really don't know these. You know, I I don't want to cuff it. There are such sometimes I just don't know. I don't know this company. I don't know the stock. The pattern is obviously very. You know, it's been a beaten down stock. It's pretty bearish. Is it all factored in? You know, these these smaller biotech stocks that were that like um, rely on a couple of things. Oh, they're reporting data tomorrow. Yeah, I have no idea. I I have no edge on this stock. Um, I tend to play in things I understand. This is also really something key. I really understand technology. I really understand the Fed. I don't understand Bluebird Bio, you know, and whatever they're reporting. There are some guys um, who really do understand this. They're really good on they're on the stream. I have one guy, I can't think of his handle after uh, right here, but he's really good on the bios. Um, I would rather, believe it or not, still own Facebook at 107 than this thing. I have no idea what this thing is. So my, uh, my, my thesis is just stick to what you know. Sort of, uh, it's just sort of what worked for me. I like to keep my focus on stocks narrow. I know that a lot of people try to have, you know, be involved in so many different trades. It winds up being a big problem. Um, I think we're, uh, I'll cover one more. Uh, let me just see, what was this? With Microsoft, someone asked me about Microsoft. Um, stock is consolidating, it looks bullish. I said this in a video that, um, you know, I really had not been very bullish on Microsoft. 
I it had been in, it actually looks, believe it or not, the pattern looks a lot like Bank of America does now. So maybe we are going to get the rate hike at some point um, and get the breakout. But I do think that Microsoft apparently has done a lot more with their business. I really believe that Google had been eating into them a lot. I guess not as much as I thought. So the reference on Microsoft now is going to be the old all-time high from the dot-com days. I cannot even believe we're talking about these levels again, um, which was 59.97, so basically close to 60 bucks. Um, that's probably where the stock is going to go at some point. So you probably will be okay with owning Microsoft on, you know, to at least maybe play by the dip. I'm not sure what their yield is right now. They do pay a dividend. Um, it's really expensive. I mean, their their dividend is two dollars and sixty-five cents, and their PE. I have to take a look at what their forward PE is, but they're trading at thirty-six PE. It's expensive. It's probably going to. It's crazy with the market. Expensive tends to get more expensive. I would think it's probably looking to retest that area. Anyhow, um, and then if you know if you lose the gap, just get out. You know, it's gonna it's gonna lose. It'll it'll. It'll it'll start probably probably fill in that gap, and it's spent a few days up here. So I think if you start losing into the gap, it's probably going to accelerate. But um, it's not looking that way. It's looking like consolidation. Anyhow, um, if you're not following me on Twitter, my handle is at Justin Pulitzer. If you came late to this broadcast, or if you feel the need to watch it again, you could find it on my YouTube channel, which is Justin Pulitzer Trades. And let's have a good rest of our trading week. And cheers. <laughs>